I have, at several points in time, made statements some people thought were really inflammatory. Like, I legitimately believe that there are a large swaths of the Republican Party that wouldn't take much pushing to be outwardly in favor of slavery again. And stuff like that seems really abstract and impossible to comprehend. Unless you know your history. Or, uh, until you see what they're trying to do right now with history. Um, because the push against critical race theory in education is really just a push against honesty in, um, in, in telling our history and in understanding it. These are two approved Louisiana history textbooks for the state's eighth graders. This is how one of them introduces the Civil War as tough times for a poor young white woman whose family owned 120 slaves. Now, I want to go over this with you, okay? This is the introduction to secession and civil war. Keep in mind that in many parts of this country, we still have like lost causers, people who teach the civil war as a war of northern aggression, um, that it's all about states' rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not like this is coming out of nowhere. But anyway, let's learn, huh? Kate Stone was 20 years old and a member of a wealthy planter family. Notice the term being used. When the Civil War began, after Kate's father died, her mother Amanda oversaw the family's business affairs. Business affairs. Just, again, the very explicit la uh, uh, lack of some terms being used. In 1860, the Stones moved to a cotton plantation near the Mississippi River in East Carroll Parish. With more than 1,000 acres and 150 slaves, there we go, finally, the slaves get mentioned, um, the family's future seemed secure. However, in 1861, after Louisiana secession from the U.S. in January and the beginning of the Civil War in April, the lives of everyone on the Stone Plantation changed. Secession is the withdrawal of a state from the Union. Kate kept a diary and wrote about many of the changes in their lives. Eventually, all five of Kate brothers served in the war on the Confederate side. In 1861, Kate wrote that the oldest was wild to be off to Virginia because he feared the fighting would be over before he can get there. I can't read, it's too small. Imagine not having a giant 2K monitor. However, as the war dragged on, worry about her brothers became a constant theme in her diary. Sadly, by the end of 1863, two of her brothers died while serving in the Confederate Army, one from, now we go to the pneumonia, the other in an accident. In her diary, Kate expressed her firm Confederate patriotism, insisting our cause is just and must prevail. What cause? But even for a patriot, the war's hardships became difficult to take. Union forces arrived on the family's plantation in 1862. With them came a justified fear their slaves would abandon the plantation for the freedom they believed the Union army would provide. A justified fear their slaves would abandon the plantation for the freedom they believed the Union army would provide. In an attempt to limit her losses, Amanda Stone sent 120 slaves to Texas in 1863. She and Kate were forced to follow the slaves to Texas later that year. In the family's absence, the few remaining slaves took over the plantation and moved into the family's home, dividing the rooms and the Stones' remaining personal property among themselves. The Stone woman would remain refugees, people who are forced to leave their home or country, until the end of the war in 1865. So to be really, really clear, you're not a refugee if you move yourself and over a hundred slaves in an effort to prevent those slaves from being liberated. Just to be clear, okay? Now, these are the refugees Republicans care about. They were able to reclaim their plantation, but due to emancipation, the freeing of slaves, lost all their property in slaves. The family had to face the new reality of planting and harvesting their fields with freed people who Kate regretted now demanded high wages. Hmm. Kate felt ambivalent about the end of slavery, but after the war, she did her best to adjust to a world that she felt had been turned upside down. She married, raised children, and devoted herself to memorializing the service of Confederate soldiers like her brothers. She founded the Madison Parish Chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, and remained active in her death until 1907. In this chapter, we will examine the political and cultural issues that led to secessional tensions and ult bet you they're not going to say slavery, and ultimately led Louisiana to secede from the Union. We will also learn about the wartime experiences of soldiers, politicians, civilians, and slaves in Union-occupied areas of Louisiana and in the parts of the state that will remain in Confederate hands throughout the war. 
etc. Now, um, I want you to imagine this is the introduction to a textbook on World War II. And we are reading it from the perspective of a, <clears throat> a wealthy, uh, industrious Nazi family who were proud members of the party, uh, who gave up um, Jewish neighbors to the, uh, to the SS, which describes in heartbreaking detail the losses that they had to experience as, uh, as, their, uh, as their nation was invaded. They were refugees. Um, and then at the end, they said, you know, at the end of all this, Hans felt ambivalent about the end of the Holocaust. But afterwards, he tried his best to adjust a world to a world in which things had been turned down. He married, he raised children, and devoted himself to memorializing the service of Wehrmacht soldiers. Of course, he couldn't do that, because in Germany, after the liberation of their people, they made it illegal to memorialize and celebrate Nazis. See, there are... There's a narrative in this country that there is a moral equivalence between the activities of the Union and the Confederacy, and there is absolutely nothing which could be further from the truth. By any assessment of the situation, the South were the bad guys in the situation on every level. They fired the first shot in the war, thus initiating the armed conflict. They seceded illegally. They didn't actually have a legal right to do that, believe it or not no matter what people might tell you. And, and here's the important part. The reason they seceded was because they wanted to keep their slaves. The state constitutions of the secessionary Confederate states, for the most part, explicitly made clear the reason they did so was to preserve a culture in which whites were superior to blacks. Everything about them was the bad guy. They were fighting to defend the right to own other people. There's really no getting around that. And I don't think that people have a right to celebrate Confederate soldiers any more than I think people have a right to celebrate Nazi soldiers. I'm sure there are plenty of people in Nazi Germany who have great-grandfathers who served with the Wehrmacht. And you know what they do? They don't celebrate the political cause the Wehrmacht supported. They don't do that over there in Germany. They simply do not. At least, though, in that case, I think you could actually make a stronger argument for the celebration of Wehrmacht ancestors in Nazi Germany. You know why? Because at least the Wehrmacht, during Nazi Germany, served Germany. The Confederate soldiers were traitors. Sorry, in modern Germany, my bad. The Confederate soldiers were traitors here in America. They weren't Americans. They seceded from America. What am I being clipped on exactly? Should we not celebrate U.S. soldiers? Funny question. Not even one that's relevant here, though. Confederates weren't U.S. soldiers. Simple as that. They weren't. They seceded from America. They attacked America. They traitorously seceded from America for the purpose of defending slavery and then attacked America. They weren't U.S. soldiers. They were literally not American. They, they're, they're, the entire thrust of the secession was so that they wouldn't be American. So no, so no there's, there's, there's nothing here. There's nothing to it. But the language of this, what do you think an eighth grader is going to take reading this? Not only is this text woefully misrepresentative of the political situation that led to the Civil War, this text is sympathetic to the worst humans who participated in it. It's a sympathy story for slave owners, and not a sympathy story that even ends well. It's not a sympathy story that ends with Kate realizing slavery was wrong. She felt ambivalent towards it, and this crazy non-slavery world that was turned upside down, she just had to make a life of it, you know? It ends with her talking about how she continued to celebrate the deaths of people who fought for the right to own black people. This text is pro-slavery. It is pro the narrative that undermines understanding of slavery. It is pro the narrative that uh, annuls and that celebrates the crimes of slavers and of the Confederacy. And it's terrifying. There are kids reading this. 
This is approved. This is in a history textbook. Kids who, kids who read this are a lost cause. Funnily enough. I mean, if you read this, like, so much work has to be done. So much work has to be done to undo the biases that are grained into your head through, through, through reading something like this. How do we combat this? Keep pushing people leftward, I guess. 